Hello, everyone. Today we have Dr. Mariana Menegat. And uh, how are you, Mari? Welcome to the show. Thank you, Marcia. I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Good. Uh, really appreciate your time here today. You know, our, our history go back all the way down to Brazil from our vet school there. And, uh, you know, for people that are not familiar with uh, your journey, if you can just uh, share that with, with folks. Yeah, that would be great. Um, just like you said, we share the same home country, um, Brazil. So I went to vet school there. Um, that's when I very first time that I got my first exposure to swine production. Um, I joined the swine group there um, when I was in vet school uh, in Porto Alegre, so it's south of Brazil, um, and started to just help on research. Um, the grad students do a lot of very good commercial applied research in cell farms, mostly applied reproduction and production. Uh, so I started to learn you know, how to do commercial research and how production really works. So I really enjoyed that. Before I finished uh, that school, I did my final internship with a large integrator in Brazil. And I got to see then the entire production system, all the phases, how the logistic works and everything. Really found it fascinating and really wanted to keep learning. So I went back to school. So I went back to the university uh, under Dr. Bortoloso, did my master's in swine reproduction. Uh, got to understand a lot of the applied science behind reproduction of boars of sows and goats. Uh, I think everything that I know today about reproduction, it's really um, because I learned with them. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, wanted to keep on the same applied path, uh, but this time with nutrition. So I was lucky to get a position with Kansas State, um, get my PhD with the applied swine nutrition team from 2016 to 2019. Uh, finished up last year and joined Holden Farms as an in-house production nutritionist. So today I help oversee the nutritional program for all uh, 70,000 salts that we have today. Amazing. Yeah, no, great, great journey there with a, a lot of good people. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, from all the way from Brazil to K-State to uh, Holden, great people there as well. So um, let's see, Mari, you, you have a lot of experience on the whole compensatory growth side of things and phase feeding, and uh, you also updated the latest, latest uh, K-State uh, nutrition manual, so we can touch on those things. So compensatory growth, Mari, what, what are some highlights there? Hmm. Yeah, this is a topic that I really enjoy, um, and it was not something that I started looking um, as like my primary goal was to study compensatory growth. It was actually my previous research uh, on phase feeding that led me to explore and understand compensatory growth because I was seeing in, in my data that was something um, different in the way that pigs were growing when we were feeding them lower lysing levels earlier. Um, and I, I looked at a lot of data in the research and the literature to understand this research. Um, and I think it's a controversial topic, um, but I think we can definitely see the physiological mechanisms and see that in practice. I do believe, and there is data to support that uh, compensatory growth exists in PEG and we can, try to understand how to explore and how to exploit that efficiency of growth um, in our commercial setting. So that's, I guess, the, the main takeaway of compensatory growth today. And, and it's not a new topic. It's something that goes back to, I think, the first time that they mentioned in animals is 1916 in the literature. And then on the 50s and 60s, they explored more. Uh, and then we uh, kind of forgot for a little bit and now it's kind of coming back uh, the concept and how to explore the concept very cool and and for folks to understand right uh it's there's always limit to things right so you can 
for example, lysine is the one that we focus a lot, right? So you can go slightly deficient in lysine in early finishing. And, uh, and if you are at the requirement or slightly above the requirement in late finishing, they, um, they catch up, right? What, what are these pillars, right? You have the duration and the magnitude. What, what else should we, should we keep in mind? Yes. So um, there are some factors that are key. They are key determinants on whether compensatory growth will occur or not and the extent of compensatory growth. Um, maybe to go back a little bit um, for the folks that are listening to us, what is compensatory growth, right? So it's basically a period of accelerated growth uh, following a period of growth restriction. And this growth restriction is typically induced by a nutritional deficiency. So one of the main key point of compensatory growth is to induce a restriction in growth. So the pigs can have this period of accelerated growth that typically has a higher efficiency of nutrient utilization, right? And there are two types of compensatory growth that sometimes we forget. Uh, pigs can compensate completely or incompletely. So in the complete compensatory growth, pigs are going to have this fast growth rate after restriction and will be able to achieve a similar final weight as pigs that were not previously restricted at the same biological age. When pigs have incomplete compensatory growth, they they do have this period of accelerated growth, but they don't reach the exact same final body weight as pigs that were not previously restricted. So it doesn't mean that they did not compensate, but it was not sufficient. So the factors that we're talking about, they determine if it will happen or not, and if it will be complete or incomplete. So there are, I think, four that the literature since the 60s has clearly defined. Um, the first one is genetics. The second is the stage of growth. The third is the nature of restriction. Uh, so how we are going to impose this restriction nutritionally. And the last one is how do you define those patterns, you know, the duration, the levels, and the timing. And uh, if we look at each one of them, individually, they have an impact. And collectively, they also interfere in one another. So that's the challenge. That's where compensatory growth gets really complex and is a physiological complex process. So do you want to talk a little bit about each one of them? Do you think that yeah, would be interesting? Let's dive right in. Okay. So the first one that I mentioned was the genetics or the genotype and the stage of growth. And that's uh, one that... Uh, looking back to the old literature, we see pigs that had a very different genotype than the lean genotype that we have today. And we see compensatory growth occurring in any genotype. Uh, we see it in barrels and gilts, entire males. Uh, so that's not the point. I think the point with genotype is understanding um, when those pegs in your particular genetics have the potential to achieve their upper limit to protein deposition or their PD max. Uh, it's sh sh sure, sure that pegs are going to be able to express compensatory growth before they reach their PD max. So at that point, pegs are in the energy dependent stage of growth. So, uh, the energy intake likely determines how much protein they're going to deposit and how fast they can be growing, right? So when we restrict pegs during this energy dependent stage of growth and we allow them to go through the compensatory growth period before they reach PD max is when we can have compensatory growth. After that, during the protein dependent stage of growth, uh, the pigs don't have the ability to express compensatory growth. So that is a key point, I guess. Okay, so let, let, let me see if I got this right. Um, okay, so the PD max there, right, that, that point of maximal protein deposition, which is roughly around 80 to 90 kilogram body weight on current genetics, um, it's a big um, milestone. But then uh, what I needed to make clear here for me and for folks is, that restriction can be should be done 
before that point. Mm -hmm. And then after that point, the pigs can compensate or no, they cannot compensate. As I understand, they can, but Mm -hmm. I I know we're using a lot of very similar words and things and people can get confused. So the point, is that a fair statement? You restrict early before PDMAX and they generally are going to compensate after. Yes. Exactly. So that's the key aspect of being able to do the restriction and allow compensatory growth to occur during this period that is before the PD max. Uh, So generally thinking uh, very simple is uh, inducing this period of restriction around the growing period of the pegs and not the finishing stages. So you have the early um, period to allow compensation, if that makes sense. Right, right. It does. It does. What What is the next point? Okay. So that goes to together with a stage, right? So when we're talking about the stage is because of the genotype. So we have to keep in mind, understand um, what kind of genetics we have. And if, if we have to do this uh, restriction, it has to be earlier. So that's the, the key point of timing or the stage of growth, right? Um, so the Third point would be uh, the nature of nutritional restriction. And uh, looking back at the literature, there are two main groups. The first one is we're going to induce the restriction by changing diet formulation. So we will change maybe one nutrient level, let's say lysine or amino acids or crude protein. But we are going to allow pigs to have full access to feed. We're not going to restrict feeding intake. And in a different scenario, we are going to formulate diets to their requirements, but we're going to restrict feeding intake. So in in both scenarios, we're inducing a restriction and pigs are going to respond by reducing growth rate. But in the first case, we are likely uh, reducing their protein deposition. If we're reducing amino acids, they don't have the amino acid capacity to deposit protein at the same rate. So if you look at what's happening with those pigs, they, um, their body composition will be different at that period of restriction. If they're depositing less protein, their body fat to body protein will be higher. On the second case, if we are restricting the entire feeding take, they're also being restricted in energy. So when they are restricted, they are going to be depositing less fat. So their body fat to body protein uh, will be lower. So why this is important? This is important because the, the there is a target body composition that pigs will aim to achieve. And this is determined by their genetic makeup. Um, so when those pigs change that equilibrium on the body fat and body protein, during compensatory growth, they will try to go back and achieve that target body composition. And it will be different, right? So in the first case, we have less protein deposition. When we remove the restriction and start feeding adequate levels of amino acids and, and protein, those animals will try to compensate for the uh, loss in protein deposition by being more efficient in depositing protein and having higher um, lean deposition. And usually they do that by improving feed efficiency. On the second case, they are gonna increase their feed intake because they were restricted in feed intake, right? So they're gonna have a higher intake that will increase their energy intake, increase their fat deposition because they didn't have all that fat storage. And also they're going to have larger visceral organs because of the higher feed intake and gut fill. So the, the, the mechanism by how they're compensating is completely different. And we're going to have a different end result of our compensatory growth. Very good. This is, no, this is very helpful. And what do you think are the most common misunderstandings on this topic? So that would be the first one. Um, comparing those two are not a fair comparison. Uh, basically, when 
when I look at some papers in their discussion, um, sometimes it's just not a fair discussion. It's not a fair comparison when you look at your results and you're inducing an amino acid restriction and you compare your results in carcass characteristics to pigs that were restricted in feed intake. And they're just going to be different. They're going to have um, a lower yield, for example, because they are growing this during this compensatory growth by increasing their visceral organs and the gut fill, which is different than when we're inducing an increase in amino acids and they are depositing more lean protein, right? So I think that is uh, probably one of the common misconceptions or misunderstandings on compensatory growth. Cool. And yeah, another one is probably that the, the fact that it actually exists, right? It's it's mm-hmm. it's uh, fairly well fairly well documented once you start uh, looking for it. Yeah, but I think that is one of the issues because if you look at those kind of comparisons, uh, you're going to see people saying, well, I didn't see compensatory growth because it was not the same way as the other study reported, which is which is completely different, you know? Um, and maybe because there is no one single measure of compensatory growth that we could just apply to every single study sometimes makes it difficult for people to understand. So that's what we did when we went back and look at some of those studies and determine, well, we have to determine a clear restriction period and a clear recovery period to be able to just compare, compare the group that was never re- restricted against the group that was restricted. And it's it's usually very clear when they compensate, they're going to grow faster than the pigs that were not previously restricted, even though they were fed the same diet during the recovery. So that is a clear indication of compensatory growth. And it's usually uh, the feed efficiency when we're talking about amino acids and not feeding take. Let's talk about uh, numbers, right? Uh, from your review uh, that you've published on the topic um, this year, uh, you mentioned, I believe you mentioned uh, 10 to 30% reduction in lysine. Mm-hmm. And that is um, probably around that first third of the finishing phase uh any like what would be uh, some practical recommendations and and we can also discuss hey would you go 30 percent in real real production or maybe not that you know what's your take there on this topic yes the in the lead review most of the studies were not commercial studies Uh, so the average for pigs that were able to compensate in all those studies was 30 percent um, pigs that were able to compensate incompletely or not compensate were ranging around 35%. So it's not a huge difference. But um, that means that for um, those type of studies, 30% may work. The 10% comes out of the studies that we conducted with face feeding, and we restricted them about 10% on lysine. And I would be comfortable enough with 10%. But definitely not a lot of studies assessing that. So that would be an interesting area to research. Uh, what we've seen is, and that probably goes back to the fourth uh, topic that we want to talk, which is the p- patterns, right? The first thing on the patterns of restriction and recovery, uh, it can be the lysing level or the nutrient level that you're looking into. Um, it, it needs to be a certain degree in the restriction period that is enough to induce the growth restriction that will capture the compensatory growth later on. For example, if you just reduce lysing level a little bit below the requirement, pigs may grow just lower, but it will not be enough to induce the compensatory growth later on. And if you restrict them too much, uh, it may be a permanent stunting and you're not going to be able to recover their performance Never, basically. And another point is uh, how much of those levels you're going to implement in the recovery. So if you think about how they're growing faster and more efficiently in the, in the compensatory growth period, you need to allow the nutrients level, levels that they need, which would be analyzing our amino acids closer to their requirements or above. 
So this seems really important because if you don't give them the nutrient levels that they need to have this fast growth, they may not compensate. Right. And um, to try to put this in numbers, right, the 10% that you mentioned, and uh, and that was super helpful, the 10 and 30, I didn't know that, mm -hmm. that detail yep. that you mentioned. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, 10%. So let's say, hey, if you are running a five diet program, and we're going to talk about number of diets here shortly, but if you're running a five diet program in that first diet, you know, depending on the energy level, but your lysine, let's say is going to be 1.10 or 15%, but let's say 1.10, just for the number's sake, 10% is, is instead of 1.10, you're going to be running at 1% digestible lysine. Is that what we're talking about? Yep. Yeah, yep. it's that it's not a huge difference, but it will be in, from our perspective, our studies, it's able to induce some compensatory growth. So it's exactly trying to do that fine tuning to the exact number that is not an aggressive strategy is just fine tuning to be able to capture efficiency right after. Uh, and maybe this is a good disclaimer. When we talk about restriction, a lot of people think uh, restriction is an aggressive strategy and that that's not the conversation that we want to have. We don't want to affect uh, welfare. We don't want to impact uh, the pig's um, life, basically. We don't want to induce another stress. Uh, it's usually just tweaking the diet formulation to be able to hold a little bit their maximum growth to be able to capture their efficiency later on. Right. And then save. Have you ever calculated like how much can you save? Are we talking a few dollars maybe? Or? Um, I have not because it, it may change depending on how you do it. Uh, sometimes uh, in the case of face feeding, it may not change your cost of diets in the entire program uh, because you're going to feed maybe lower le levels earlier than higher levels later on average is kind of the same, but the logistics, I guess, uh, makes a lot of difference or uh, just the efficiency of your processes, the efficiency of nutrient utilization is another one that needs to be taken into account. And sometimes there is no easy dollars to calculate. Right, right. Yeah, it would be good to calculate like just a regular program and then a program on phase one and two where you'd be 10% um, below, you know, and it would be good to, to get just a ballpark for that. And talking about on, on this fictional five phase program, um, you know, maybe the first phase is 20 to 40 kilogram body weight and then 40 to 60, 60 to 80. So all the first three phases are uh, below the PD max, would you do that 10% in all those three or not? What would you do, Mari? Um, yeah, it's, it, it depends. Uh, if you look back at the phase feeding strategies that we did, uh, the two phase feeding program was exactly that. We had a very long phase in the beginning and then a short phase um, before marketing and that worked really well. Uh, so we allow the pegs to have um, a, a, a long period of restriction, but early on, and then another long period of recovery with lysine levels above their requirements later on. Uh, and I think this can work very well using lysine levels at their requirement or slightly below the requirement. I think one important thing that we have to consider when thinking about that is how much uh, information you can capture from your system. If you're fairly comfortable with your average starting weight and your average feed intake, that strategy should be fine uh, with lysine levels slightly below the requirement. If you have some questions about uh, how to the practice, the really uh, what's happening in the field converts to what you're formulating for, if there is some discrepancy there, you might be a little bit more cautious. And I'll try to explain why. Uh, if we formulate diets for 60 pound pigs, but we're actually getting pigs at 55 pounds, or we estimate a feeding take and it's 10% lower, we're actually restricting lysine more than we think 
in formulation. So that can create an extra decrease in gain that may be too much for pigs to be able to compensate. So keeping that in mind, I think uh, starting the pigs um, earlier on the restriction. So we're starting if you're doing a longer phase, it has to be in the grower period. So it gives time and enough lysing later on for it to compensate and understanding what is your your assumption of body weight and feeding take should give you good indications of where to start and how to design those programs. How many, st on your compensatory growth review, just so we can wrap up the compensatory growth topic, how, do you recall how many studies you looked at across the literature? Um, well, there are many, many studies. I don't know the number, but we had some very strict um protocols to include it in our study. And it usually involved having a very clear restriction period and a very clear re recovery period where the treatments would have the same diet fatting the recovery. So we could compare very fairly, right? Uh, so we were able to put 14 studies and within those 14 studies, we were able to do comparisons within each study, de depending on how many treatments they had. So at the end, we had 57 comparisons. Very good. And I remember, oh boy, like five years ago or something, I was in Australia watching this conference um, about, um, the, was the APSA conference and, and, yeah. and they, there was two papers about a single diet and, and I remember coming back all excited. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've done, what, five studies now? I think, was it five in face feeding? It was four in, five, in face feeding and then there's little review. So, yeah. Very nice. Four studies. Four studies. So, for people that are not familiar with your studies on face feeding, if you, I know you touched a little bit already, but if you can give us some highlights there. Yeah. So, we were able to compare uh, what was the impact of feeding uh, from four phases down to one phase uh, during the grow finish period. And that would be um, 25 to 125 kilograms of body weight. And, and we noticed that there was no difference in performance and carcass characteristics if we decrease from four to three or two phases. In our studies, uh, it seemed like the one phase feeding program uh, decreased their their body weight and their growth rate a little too much that they were not able to catch up. Uh, it could be the levels of lysing that we were using or, you know, other environmental factors. We conducted all those trials under commercial research conditions. Uh, so that could be one factor. Right. Uh, I would say I would also add the market weight, right? I think Australia folks have a lighter pig at marketing. That could be another thing, definitely. Um, so we were able to see that using uh, lysing level set at the requirement and also is likely below the requirement. Um, so every time that we have a longer phase, uh, and in the case of the two phase feeding program, we define the, the longer phase earlier. So it would be the very first phase would be a, a longer phase from 60 to 160 pounds, for example. And we would have essentially, so people understand when you design a phase, you have all your nutrient requirements set to the average body weight, right? So you are going to have pigs starting that phase a little bit deficient in their nutrients. And then when they're finishing up that phase, they're going to get nutrients above their requirements, right? And that's essentially the concept of compensatory growth, if you think about it. So we are allowing within a longer phase for pigs to have a slower period of growth and then a more efficient period of growth, exploring compensatory growth. And that was exactly what we started seeing We when we were feeding those pigs uh, for a longer period of time with the same diet, they would compensate right after. And when we were comparing to a four-phase feeding program that sometimes in one phase, they were getting the exact same diet. They were growing faster than the pigs that were in a four-phase feeding program, which led them to get to exact same overall average daily gain and final body weight. And, and I think that was the fascinating part of the phase feeding program.
Yeah, and and people uh, people talk about um, you know genetic programming, and there you know you can look at that in multiple ways. But one is this exactly like the pigs really follow the genetic programming is one way I look at it. Yeah, now that goes back to that uh, target body composition. So the pigs, they compensate only for a short period of time, right? This is an important thing to to remember. They're not going to have this fast growth rate forever, but it would be for the period of time until they achieve this target body composition that it's their genetic makeup, basically. Very cool. And then um, from our practical standpoint today for people, let's say, that are doing 20 kg body weight up to 125, 130. How many diets would you be comfortable with? Yeah, that is something that may change depending on how you have your feeding programs. If you have diets that you always have antibiotics or you have another type of feed additive, then you're going to use in your last diet or other additives or antibiotics that you need a withdrawal program that can always affect the number of phases because you know you're going to have a phase just for that specific strategy but uh, i think we should be comfortable around four phases unless you need to have another phase um, for that Uh, and and then in within each system it's important to assess maybe three would work also yeah i mean i agree why why not two yeah i think two is also something that could work uh, the research showed exactly that uh, it's just that people have to understand if we have everything possible in our system to deliver that uh, if we have too much variation in 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 the starting weight uh, maybe we have to formulate just a little bit higher on lysine but it's possible we just don't want to be as aggressive all the time when we restrict the number of phases. So that's why I say it, it may be different from each system and how you formulate, but definitely we could feed for uh, two diets, moving from four to two and get to the same result uh, if we know that all the things in the system are in place uh, for that. Very good. And and for people that are not familiar with the work from Australia, with the lighter pig again, they were actually able, same diff, uh, one diet was enough. Uh, but again, it's a lighter pig. Uh, two diets, right? Um, and then three, I like the, the comments there, Mari. And also f- folks from feed meal managers would mm-hmm. really like that idea. Yes, right. definitely. I think that's one of the great benefits of simplifying a feeding program and uh, it, it goes back to just reduce one phase or just reassess your program and see how you can simplify one thing at a time uh, in the feed mill especially if you're palleting that is a big deal because we know that we can reduce the change over time um, just by having fewer diets so we have more tonnage running through the same palate standards, uh, the palate meal standards for that diet. And then we don't have to do any changeovers or extra changeovers. So that is a big plus for sure. And then if you think about uh, in a production system, all the potential mistakes, when you have more diet, you increase those mistakes. Um, Formulation, manufacturing, delivery, storage, the feed budget, just checking things in the office, even for the feed budget. It's another set of diets that you have to make sure it's correct. And we are seeing that maybe it's not that important to have all those diets. And if we have four instead of five or three instead of five, we are improving all of that logistics and it saves time and makes things more um, more precise in that sense. Right. And people talk about, uh, very often people talk about the feed budget, right? And some people mm-hmm. are passionate about like, you know, these pigs need to get this amount of feed uh, on this time. And of course, when right after winning, it's more important than mid finishing. But your work has really, uh, you know, 
I think I was already, I already had a little bit of that thought. Basically, you know, if you go back to um, Dr. Roger Main's work where he saw a little bit of the early versus late uh, catch up like you, you've, you saw. But what's your take on feed budget? I mean, if you just show that the pigs are fairly resilient, if you are delayed by a few days or maybe even a week uh, as when it comes to, to feed budget and, and uh, like, is that a, as, as, as big of a deal as some people think? Yeah, it may, it may not be. It depends on how much we're messing with the feed budget. But uh, definitely, it's not going to be a few pounds that are going to change the growth rate of the animals. Uh, so typically, what we do is when we see um, mistakes made in the feed budget, you know, you just you just keep going. You don't go back and feed more of the diet that we um, skip a few pounds or, you know, missed a few tonnage. Um, it I think the pigs are fairly resilient and keep keep going in with their growth rate based on we um, provide them. Uh, so one thing that is very clear in some of those studies in Roger Main studies, one, we cannot restrict pigs before marketing. So less diet is a very important diet. So we don't want that one to be um, deficient or restricted in intake. So that one is really important. If you can get them to that diet and provide the adequate nutrient levels in that diet, they are able to catch up and, and improve their, their growth for sure. Right. And just to emphasize to folks, I mean, right after winning the first, second diet, those are yeah. important. <laughs> yeah. Those are definitely yeah. important when it comes to feed budget, right? So Exactly. Yeah. I was talking more on the finisher, but nursery is, is one that we don't want to uh, change that for sure. Right. Very cool. And then a lot of uh, the other work you've done uh, was the revamping of the K-State Nutrition Manual. I'm sure it was a lot of work and, and a blast. Uh, what, how was that? How was that uh, to do that work? Oh, that was great. I learned so much and I was able to go back to so many studies and having to get the most important information and synthesize in a way that is accessible to many people, producers, students, everyone in the field uh, was really, really great. Um, so I did that for part of the swine nutrition guide. And then after I finished, um, uh, Dr. Hayden Williams did another part. So it was a collaborative effort and uh, it was fun researching ways to provide that information. Um, kind of went back to what people want to see. What do they want to read? And that's why we kind of um, have the information available in the website. So short paragraphs, a lot of different sub subtopics and topics. So if you're in the barn or, you know, just want to take a look at your phone, you're uh, going somewhere and you just want a quick information, you can just look at your phone and it's going to be there. But if you're studying, um, you know, you want to learn more about a subject, you can download the PDF. So that's a, like a short fact sheet, but has all the information in one place uh, and kind of get it until we got to that model. We researched different strategies and I think it's working. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that people are using it. Yeah, that was a great, great work. And I certainly used it a lot. So good. very good. My Anything else on this topic of uh, compensatory growth or phase feeding? Um, yeah, so I think um, maybe if we want to go back a little bit to the purpose of doing this, right? The purpose of this topics and this conversation, um, it goes back to what we know. And I think we know requirements very well, right? I'm not sure if you agree, Marcio, but we know the amino acid requirements very yeah. well. And we have the tools to keep exploring that. Every time that we have genetic improvement, we can conduct robust experiments and define the requirements of the pegs. And you as a nutritionist, you can formulate diets to maximize growth just by following the requirements to the dot. And I think... We may be able to do that a couple of times in our lives as production nutritionists, 
but not many, right? <laughs> Especially like this year, it was definitely not a year to do that. And we have to be able to formulate diets just right. And I think Wayne Cast is the one to say that, that that's the challenge you no know, the details how do you formulate just right uh, to improve productivity improve economics and uh, just be more efficient so when we take all of that information on requirements that we understand so well um, how do we you know think of it different how do we come up with different strategies that we can apply more times during the, the year and I think that's the concept, you know, with compensatory growth and face feeding. We understand the requirements, but how can we use that to be more efficient, to be more economical? So can we reduce our requirements um, below, earlier, so below the requirements earlier and feed the, the requirements later and achieve a, a better efficiency by saving money? Or should we really increase our levels in the last phases, because we know it's where we're capturing that game uh, and, you know, improve our, our, our final body weight, our carcass gain. Uh, so I think that's the goal, you know, just try to help people think outside of the box and use the information that we know for sure is good because compensatory growth is, is not easy. It's complex um, and it's it's hard to do trials, but we can start to learn how to use that concept and exploit that concept if we use what we have and we are sure that we have, which are the requirements. I love it. Yeah, it's a great topic. And I mean, the pig production business is a tough business, yes. commodity business, small margins and uh, high volatility. So anything that can help producers is off value. Mari, there are three questions that we ask every guest. The first one is, uh, what's your favorite pig-related book? Uh, favorite is a hard one. Uh, maybe I'll give you the books that I'm reading right now. Would that work? Yeah. Okay, so right now I'm reading a new book that is uh, The Suckling and Winged Pig. Uh, it's the same editor as The Gestating and Lactating Sow, which is another book that I really like, uh, Chantal Farmer. And there is great information about physiology and management of the young pig. So I'm really hoping to understand how, you know, to uh, remove uh, some of the variation that we see in how we start pigs and improve pre-weaning mortality. So that has been a very good read so far. Super cool. How about uh, your favorite book outside of uh, livestock? And that's another one that I'm currently reading and I'm enjoying, and it's called Sapiens, uh, Brief Hi History of Humankind. I'm really enjoying learning about you know, our path in evolution and our own revolutions and how everything, our relationships with the environment and other species kind of um, brought us to where we are right now. Um, that has been really interesting, I guess. Very cool. I I've, uh, just pulled up here. So that's Yuval Harari right there. Mm -hmm. the author. Yep. And funny enough, about a week ago, I was watching a, a discussion between him and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And mm -hmm. it, was just, it was just odd. I mean, Mar Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. was just super odd, which is never, I had never seen that. So it was interesting. Yeah, Yuval was, uh, was kind of crushing him. Really? Is, yeah. I have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. And um well, the last one, Mari, is uh, what do you think sets apart successful swine professionals from those that are not? Um, I like to think is the collaborative mindset. Um, I guess being able to share your knowledge, share what you learn, your experience with others, and also being very open-minded to you know, receive the advice uh, and even the critiques of other people. Uh, I think that's really important. I think we can be really successful if we help others succeed, uh, sharing what we know and uh, also not being set by our own ways, on our own ways, uh, always learning and trying to get information and uh, experiences from other people. So I think that would be my, my takeaway, I guess. Uh, I love it. Now this is... 
Yeah, I mean, you see some people or some production systems that, that are not as open and um, there's always a balance. <laughs> yeah. There's always a balance. Very cool. Dr. Menegat, thanks so much for your time and your insights on this great topic of compensatory growth and face feeding. Thank you very much, Marcio. I appreciate the invite. It was really a nice talk. Uh, always nice talking to you. Thanks so much. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.